Sun Shen, A Song of Snow. Farewell to Administrative Assistant Wu, returning to the capital. A north wind rolled across the plain, killing the pasture grass. In the eighth month, Tartar skies were filled with snow. As if spring's breath had come one night, with ten million pear trees breaking into blossom. It blew through pearl screens, melted on silk curtains, no warmth in fox fur coats or under brocade quilts. The general's inlaid bow was so cold he could not draw it. The marshal's steel armor froze to his skin. Ice covered this vast desert a hundred yards deep. Gloomy clouds darkened ten thousand frigid miles. The general laid a feast to toast your transfer home. With frontier music, tartar lutes and nomad flutes. A blinding snow at evening cloaked the headquarters gate. Strong winds shook red banners, frozen stiff. I see you off from the east gate at Luntai. Snow has blocked all routes through the heavenly mountains. The road bends around hills and soon you will disappear, leaving your horse's hoofprints behind you as you go. So here we have the last poem, the last of a trilogy of poems about the campaign of Grandmaster Feng Changqing into the Western regions. If the previous two poems that we have already had chance to read and to comment basically centered on the general, on his leading the campaign into the West, on his success, this poem focuses on another character. Uh, from the title we can see that the the, the person that is the focalizer of this poem is the administrative assistant Wu, who is leaving the western regions and going back to the capital. So, what can we say of this poem? It will be in many aspects similar to the previous ones. The main topic, of course, will be uh, the frontier. Serving in the frontier, warfare against the barbarians, and the alien, exotic and harsh landscape of the northwestern borders. As opposed to the other two poems, Another very important topic here is going to be um, parting, yeah? because there is an official who is leaving. So we will have elements including the parting celebration, the parting feast, and the sadness at seeing the friend go away. So the poem in uh, this translation by uh, Geoffrey Waters is divided into three stanzas. And it's quite adequate because they generally do correlate with the three main topics of the poem, as we will see. The first stanza basically describes uh, the coldness of the landscape where the soldiers are fighting. It's defined by cold and ice. It's a land of ice. Uh, the second stanza takes us to the party, the farewell party, but still insists uh, and reiterates images of the coldness and of the intense freeze of this region. Finally, the last stanza goes on with the departure and describes the departure of Assistant Wu. So let's uh, go couplet by couplet. We begin. A northern wind rolled across the plain, killing the pasture grass. In the eighth month, Tartar skies were filled with snow. So the poem starts with meteorological images. Remember, this is uh, the barbarian land, and this is colder and harsher than anything you might encounter in China. So the scene starts with a wind coming from the north, the direction of cold, the direction of winter, even though this poem is set in autumn. The wind is terribly cold. It kills the grass. Even though it's the eighth month, the Tartar skies, these lands, are filled with snow. A heavy snowfall falls in autumn here, which is typical in these extreme temperature regions. So a hostile nature, a very cold and hostile nature, introduces the poem. Next couplet. So the skies are filled with snow, as if spring's breath had come one night 
with 10 million pear trees breaking into blossom. So this is an elegant image that in a way tries to mitigate the harshness of the previous one. Snow is falling in autumn. The poetic persona is watching how the snowflakes are falling thickly. And he says that they look alike. One could almost confuse them for uh, the flowers of the pear trees breaking into blossom. Pear tree flowers are white. So this sudden ocean of white falling down surrounding the poet, surrounding the army, is equated with a spring view at a much happier season or the, the flowering of the pear blossoms. This is, a, this is a very conventional image from the Sixth uh, Dynasties period, from the period of this union, which the Japanese would also imitate in their courtly poetry. They call it imitate, elegant confusion, just pretending you can confuse snowflakes for white blossoms. But well, it, even though it's pretty conventional, I think it, 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 it's quite appropriate in this poem. It does temper a bit the relentless images of cold and ice that pile line upon line. Okay, so we continue with the cold in the next couplet. It blew through pearl screens, melted on silk curtains, no warmth in fox fur coats or under brocade quilts. So this snow, this beautiful snow that is falling around, is the herald of cold. It penetrates everywhere. So the Chinese relatively luxurious quarters and clothes, perhaps of the officials, the silk curtains, the screens, the coats, the quilts, they are not impervious to the snow and to the cold. Everything gets wet, everything gets cold, including these traditional raiments that protect from the environment. The general's inlaid bow was so cold he could not draw it. The marshal's steel armor froze to his skin. Not only the clothes and the, uh, and, and, and the quilts, also the weapons suffer from the cold. The general's bow cannot be used because it's frozen and the steel armor clings to the skin of the marshal, probably provoking frostbite. I love this image of... Uh, I like this image because, you know, it reminds me images of... Uh, of the Second World War, of the German soldiers freezing in Stalingrad, having to remove their iron helmets because of the terrible cold. So, all everybody is affected by the cold. All the objects that the soldiers and the officials are wearing cannot stop the cold from coming, from sipping in. The last couplet of this stanza concludes with this image of universal winter. Ice covered this vast desert a hundred yards deep. Gloomy clouds darkened 10,000 frigid miles. Everywhere you look, on the land, on the sky, far away for miles or, for, or deep down, hundreds of yards down, the ice, the cold, are omnipresent. This is a barren land. This is the wasteland. So the next stanza... And as we say, we move here to the farewell party for administrative assistant Wu, although the party is not described in any detail. The general laid a feast to toast your transfer home with frontier music, Tartar lutes and nomad, sorry, Tartar lutes and nomad flutes. So the party is celebrated. Uh, we may imagine wine drinking and reciting. The music is foreign. So it's the music from the region. It's emphasized that the instruments that are played are the instruments of the barbarians. The Tartar lutes, probably the pipa, and uh, the nomad flutes, which we've encountered in previous poems. So exotic music at the border for saying farewell to an official. But the cold returns in the next line, the cold that is surrounding the military camp. A blinding snow at evening cloaked the headquarters gate. Strong winds shook Red banners frozen stiff. We still have snow, we still have wind. The banners are so cold that they freeze them. They are like hard mm, pieces of, of material instead of the waving, flapping banners we would expect. And even the gate, the entry to the camp, is covered, is buried by snow. Finally, the last stanza, we see the departure of Assistant Wu. I see you off from the east gate at Luntai. Snow has blocked all routes through the heavenly mountains. 
We already referred to Luntai in the previous poems, Luntai Wheel Terrace. Until I did some research on the second poem of this series, I didn't know that Luntai was a city. I thought it was a, a plateau, like it's near a terrace, a mountain terrace, as its name indicated. But no, it was an important Chinese frontier town. Uh, it had been very important in the Han, where it had rebelled and it had been taken again by the Chinese, all its population massacred, and a colony of Chinese settlers placed there. So the population is at least half Chinese, and Luntai has a vintage tradition of being a frontier outpost in the remote west. Uh, so out of the city, we suppose that the military camp is next to the city or in the city, out of the city goes uh, Assistant Wu. He cannot travel through the Tian Shan, the main mountain range uh, in the western regions. We imagine he will have to take a longer route because the snow has blocked all the paths through the mountains. And finally, a last image of Assistant Wu departing as he is being looked upon, gazed upon by Tsun Shen. The road bends around hills and soon you will disappear, leaving your horse's hoof prints behind you as you go. So the poem ends, I think, with a quite powerful image. Uh, I think this is, of the three poems that I have read of uh, Tsun Shen related to the Western campaign, I think this is the most aesthetically pleasing for me, the most effective. And it finishes with a beautiful image. You know, it has lots of images of the power, the intensity, the, the unnaturalness of the cold, but it finishes with a very beautiful image of Tsun Shen looking at a winding road, a long and winding road through the snow. The only thing left to be seen, footprints on the snow, with uh, the friend who is departing, long ago departed and no longer to be seen. So quite a nice poem about the harshness of a terrible land with a terrible climate and of a friend departing and leaving only the mildest of traces of his presence on this world of ice and snow. Quite a lovely poem. And uh, with this, we finish this section. Uh, well, not this section, this group of poems by Tsun Shen. We will continue with, with uh, Heptasyllabic Gushi. The next ones will be by our old friend, do